Hello friends, welcome to my YouTube channel starting with SIADH. SIADH does not cause hypernatremia. SIADH is the most common cause of eubolemic hyponatremia. The excess ADH secreted leads to the gain of water in the body. This stimulates baroreceptors to release atrial natriuretic peptide. Atrial natriuretic peptide leads to the loss of water and salt in the urine, leading to urine sodium level of more than 20 milli equivalents per liter in these patients. Thus, the level of water reaches a steady state that is euvolemia, but the urinary loss of sodium continues to occur giving rise to hyponatremia. SIADH is characterized by low levels of uric acid, normal BP and normal urea and creatine levels. SIADH is diagnosed based on the following criteria which is known as barter schwartz criteria. It includes reduced serum osmolality, urine osmolality more than serum osmolality, clinical euvolemia, increased levels of urinary sodium, Absence of other causes of hyponatremia like pituitary, renal, adrenal, thyroid or liver diseases. First case is a 66 year old chronic smoker who was diagnosed with small cell carcinoma of lung presents to casualty with nausea, confusion and dizziness. After the initial workup, he is diagnosed to have syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. SIADH is associated with increased urinary excretion of sodium and hyponatremia. Increased urinary excretion of sodium is about more than 20 milli equivalents per liter. Small cell cancer is commonly associated with SIADH due to the ectopic release of antidiuretic hormone. Causes of SIADH are carcinoma lung, carcinoma duodenum, carcinoma pancreas, carcinoma ovary, carcinoma bladder, carcinoma ureter and other neoplasms like thymoma, mesothelioma, bronchial adenoma, carcinoid, gangliocytoma, Ewing sarcoma, head trauma, infections like pneumonia, abscess, cavitation, tuberculosis, meningitis, encephalitis, AIDS, vascular causes like cerebrovascular occlusions, hemorrhage, cavernous sinus thrombosis, neurological causes like peripheral neuropathy, psychosis, hydrocephalus, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, delirium tremens, multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Metabolic causes acute intermittent porphyria, respiratory causes asthma, pneumothorax, positive pressure respiration. Drugs like vasopressin or desmopressin, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, high dose oxytocin, vincristin, carbamazepin, nicotine, phenothiazins, cyclophosphamide, tricyclic antidepressants, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. These all are causes of SIADH. SIADH is observed in multiple sclerosis, oat cell carcinoma of lung, acute attack of porphyria. Primary pulmonary emphysema is not a cause of SIADH. Respiratory cause of SIADH include asthma, pneumothorax, positive pressure respiration. Next case is a 47-year-old woman presented with headache and nausea. Examination did not reveal any signs of dehydration and investigations revealed the findings like serum sodium 118 millimol per litre, serum osmolality 267 milli osmol per kg, urine osmolality 362 milli osmol per kg, urine sodium 70 millimol per litre. Here, the given scenario is suggestive of SIADH and demeclocycline does not cause this condition. Demeclocycline causes nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and hence it is used in the treatment of chronic SIADH. The following features in the given case point towards the diagnosis of SIADH that is serum osmolality less than 275 milli osmol per kg, urine osmolality more than 100 milli osmol per kg, urine sodium more than 20 milli mol per liter, serum sodium level less than 135 milli mol per liter. Chromophobe adenoma is a type of pituitary adenoma that causes symptoms of hypogonadism due to pressure effects on the pituitary stalk. It is not a cause of syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Next case is a child who underwent ventriculoperitoneal shunt surgery for tubercular meningitis with hydrocephalus develops polyuria and hyponatremia. The given scenario is suggestive of cerebral salt wasting. Both SIADH and cerebral salt wasting causes hyponatremia but polyuria happens in cerebral salt wasting. 
സെറിബ്രൽ സോൾട്ട് വേസ്റ്റിംഗ് റിസൾട്ട്സ് ഫ്രം ഹൈപ്പർ സെക്രേഷൻ ഓഫ് ഏട്രിയൽ നേട്രി യുറേറ്റിക് പെപ്റ്റൈഡ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് സീൻ പ്രൈമറിലി വിത്ത് സെൻട്രൽ നെർവസ് സിസ്റ്റം ഡിസോർഡേഴ്സ് ഇൻക്ലൂഡിംഗ് ബ്രെയിൻ ട്യൂമേഴ്സ് ഹെഡ് ട്രോമ ഹൈഡ്രോസെഫാലസ് ന്യൂറോ സർജറി സെറിബ്രോ വാസ്കുലർ ആക്സിഡൻസ് ആൻഡ് ബ്രെയിൻ ഡെത്ത് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് അസോസിയേറ്റഡ് വിത്ത് ഹൈപ്പോ നേട്രീമിയ പോളി യൂറിയ ആൻഡ് എലവേറ്റഡ് യൂറിനറി സോഡിയം എക്സ്ക്രീഷൻ ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് ഈസ് ബൈ റിസ്റ്റോറിംഗ് ഇൻട്രാവാസ്കുലർ വോളിയം വിത്ത് സോഡിയം ക്ലോറൈഡ് ആൻഡ് വാട്ടർ നെക്സ്റ്റ് കേസ് ഇസ് എ പേഷ്യൻറ്റ് ഹു പ്രസൻറ്റഡ് വിത്ത് അക്യൂട്ട് കൺഫ്യൂഷൻ ആൻഡ് വോമിറ്റിംഗ് വാസ് ഡയഗ്നോസ്ഡ് ടു ഹാവ് എസ് ഐ എ ഡി എച്ച് ദിസ് കണ്ടീഷൻ ക്യാൻ ബി ബെസ്റ്റ് ട്രീറ്റഡ് ബൈ ദ ഇൻഫ്യൂഷൻ ഓഫ് ഹൈപ്പർ ടോണിക് സെലൈൻ ദറ്റ് ഈസ് ത്രീ പെർസെൻറ്റേജ് ദ ഗിവൻ സിനാരിയോ ഇസ് സജസ്റ്റീവ് ഓഫ് അക്യൂട്ട് സിംറ്റമാറ്റിക് എസ് ഐ എ ഡി എച്ച് ദിസ് മോഡ് ഓഫ് ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് ഓൾസോ ഹെൽപ്സ് ഇൻ ദ കറക്ഷൻ ഓഫ് സോഡിയം ഡെഫിഷ്യൻസി ദറ്റ് ഈസ് പാർട്ട്ലി റെസ്പോൺസിബിൾ ഫോർ ഹൈപ്പോ ന്യൂട്രീമിയ ദ അതർ ഫോം ഓഫ് ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് ഈസ് ടു ഹെൽപ്പ് റെഡ്യൂസ് ദ കോൺസെൻട്രേഷൻ ഓഫ് ബോഡി വാട്ടർ ബൈ ഗിവിംഗ് ആൻ എ വി പി റിസെപ്റ്റർ ടു ആൻറ്റാഗനിസ്റ്റ് ദറ്റ് ഈസ് കോണിവാപ്റ്റൻ കോണിവാപ്റ്റൻ ബ്ലോക്സ് ദ ആൻറ്റി ഡയോറിറ്റിക് എഫക്റ്റ് ഓഫ് എ വി പി ആൻഡ് ഇൻക്രീസസ് യൂറിൻ ഔട്ട്പുട്ട് ഡി ഡി എ വി പി ഇസ് എ സിന്തറ്റിക് അനലോഗ് ഓഫ് എ വി പി ആൻഡ് ഷുഡ് നോട്ട് ബി യൂസ്ഡ് ആസ് ഇറ്റ് വിൽ ഫർദർ ഇൻക്രീസ് വാട്ടർ റിട്ടൻഷൻ ദ ഡ്രഗ് ഓഫ് ചോയ്സ് ഫോർ ദ ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് ക്രോണിക് എസ് ഐ എ ഡി എച്ച് ഇസ് ടോൾ വാപ്റ്റൻ വാപ്റ്റൻസ് ആർ സെലക്റ്റീവ് വി ടു റിസെപ്റ്റർ ആൻറ്റാഗനിസ്റ്റ് ദറ്റ് ആക്ട് ബൈ ഇൻക്രീസിംഗ് യൂറിനറി വാട്ടർ എക്സ്ക്രീഷൻ ബൈ ബ്ലോക്കിംഗ് ദ ആൻറ്റി ഡയോറിറ്റിക് എഫക്റ്റ് ഓഫ് എ വി പി ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് ഓപ്ഷൻസ് ഫോർ ക്രോണിക് എസ് ഐ എ ഡി എച്ച് ഇൻക്ലൂഡ് റെസ്ട്രിക്ഷൻ ഓഫ് ഫ്ലൂയിഡ് ഇൻടേക്ക് ടു ബിലോ ദ ലെവൽ ഓഫ് യൂറിൻ ഔട്ട്പുട്ട് ദിസ് ഈസ് കൺസിഡേർഡ് ദ മെയിൻ സ്റ്റേ ഓഫ് ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് അതർ ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് ഓപ്ഷൻസ് ഫോർ ക്രോണിക് എസ് ഐ എ ഡി എച്ച് ഇൻക്ലൂഡ് ട്വൽവ് വാപ്റ്റൻ ഡെമക്ലോസൈക്ലിൻ ഫ്ലുഡ്രോക്രോട്ടിസോൺ അഡ്വാൻറ്റേജസ് ഓഫ് വാപ്റ്റൻസ് ഓവർ ഫ്ലൂയിഡ് റെസ്ട്രിക്ഷൻ ആർ ഫ്ലൂയിഡ് റെസ്ട്രിക്ഷൻ ഇസ് യൂഷ്വലി എ ബേർഡൻ ടു ദ പേഷ്യൻറ്റ് അൺറിലയബിൾ ഇൻ പ്രാക്ടിക്കൽ ആൻഡ് സ്ലോ ടു വർക്ക് Increased thirst is a frequently observed characteristic of hyponatremia in SIADH and it is particularly difficult to suppress. Hence, water restriction in SIADH frequently leads to non-compliance in the long run. Rapid correction of hyponatremia may result in central pontine myelinolysis. Central pontine myelinolysis is an osmotic demyelination syndrome wherein rapid correction of hyponatremia results in water being driven out of the cell which has adapted to a chronic state of hypotonicity leading to damage to the myelin sheath of these cells. It is characterized by the acute onset of quadriparasis, ataxia and abnormal extraocular movements. Next topic is multiple endocrine neoplasia. Multiple endocrine neoplasia 1 is also referred to as Wormer syndrome. Here the affected chromosome is 11Q13 or MEN1 gene. Characteristic tumors seen in MEN1 syndrome are parathyroid adenoma, entropancreatic tumors like gastrinoma which is the most common functioning tumor. Gastrinoma the most common site is duodenum. Next is pituitary adenoma, most common is prolactinoma. Associated tumors of MEN1 syndrome are angiofibroma, collagenoma, adrenal cortical tumors, lipoma, neuroendocrine tumors like gastric, thymic and also lung tumor, meningioma, pheochromocytoma and carcinoid tumors usually of the foregut. Anterior pituitary tumors are associated with MEN1 syndrome. Next is a case. A 35-year-old man presented with abdominal pain, nausea and diarrhea. He had a history of hyperparathyroidism and a transphenoidal prolactinoma resection. The given scenario is suggestive of MEN1 syndrome and gastrinoma is the most common functional enteropancreatic tumor. Enteropancreatic tumors in MEN1 syndrome are non-functioning pancreatic tumor which is the most common overall and functioning pancreatic tumors like gastrinoma, insulinoma, Glucagonoma, VIPoma which is the least common. Most common site of gastrinoma in MEN1 syndrome is the first and second part of duodenum. MEN1 syndrome is characterized by the triad of tumors involving parathyroid, pancreatic isolates and anterior pituitary. Gastrinoma is the most common pancreatic isolate tumor in MEN1 syndrome and if it is associated with marked gastric acid production and recurrent peptic ulcers, the condition is called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Around 90% of gastrinomas are found in Passaro's triangle. Its boundaries are cystic duct, junction of second and third part of duodenum, junction of body and neck of pancreas. Passaro's triangle is also known as gastrinoma triangle. 
Next case is a 30 year old man presents to OPD with complaints of recurrent episodes of weakness, headache, sweating and fainting after fasting. He tells that the symptoms improve after the consumption of food. There is a history of men one syndrome running in the family. Serum C peptide levels are found to be elevated. The given clinical scenario along with elevated serum C peptide levels point towards diagnosis of insulinoma in a men one patient. The definite treatment of choice in this patient is surgery. Insulinoma is the second most common functioning enteropancreatic tumor in men one syndrome. Investigation of choice is 72 hour fasting glucose and serum insulin levels. These parameters are measured when the patient develops hypoglycemic symptoms during a supervised 72 hour fasting period. The treatment of choice is surgery ranging from enucleation of a single tumor to pancreatectomy. Known surgical management of insulinoma includes frequent consumption of carbohydrate rich meals, octreotide or diazoxide which are not always successful. Selpercatinib, a kinase inhibitor, was recently approved by the FDA. It is used to treat tumors with a mutation in the RET gene. These are known small cell lung cancer, medullary thyroid cancer and other types of thyroid cancers in patients with a mutation in the RET gene. The most frequently observed cutaneous manifestation of men 1 syndrome is angiofibroma. Cutaneous tumors in men 1 syndrome are 85% cases are angiofibroma, 70% cases are collagenoma, 33% cases are lipoma. Next case is a 22 year old man who was diagnosed with men 1 syndrome presents to your OPD for his annual checkup. Secretin study is not done as an annual screening test in patients with men 1 syndrome. It is a provocative test for the diagnosis of gastrinoma. Annual screening test for parathyroid tumor is calcium and PTH. Annual screening test for gastrinoma is gastrin. Annual screening test for insulinoma is fasting glucose or insulin. Annual screening test for other pancreatic NATs are chromogranin A, pancreatic polypeptide, glucagon, vasoactive intestinal peptide. Annual screening test for anterior pituitary is prolactin, insulin growth factor 1. Age to begin screening for parathyroid tumor is 8. Age to begin screening of gastrinoma is 20. Age to begin screening for insulinoma is 5. Age to begin screening for other pancreatic NETs are less than 10. Age to begin screening for anterior pituitary is 5. Other imaging tests like MRI and CT might have to be done for screening of conditions like anterior pituitary tumors or adrenal tumors. To confirm the diagnosis of zollinger ellison syndrome, we should check gastric pH that is gastric pH less than 2.5 and serum gastrin more than 1000 picogram per milliliter. Normal serial gastrin is less than 100 picogram per milliliter. Provocative test can be done like the secreting stimulation test when the diagnosis is in doubt. An increase in serum gastrin more than 200 picogram per milliliter following an IV bolus of secretin is diagnostic. Other tests are basal acid output more than 15 milli equivalents per hour and also basal acid output is to MAO that is maximal acid output is increased that is more than 0.6. For localization, initial investigation like CT or MRI should be done. Best investigation is endoscopic ultrasound. If the tumor is not localized, somatostatin receptor scintigraphy should be done. The most common components of MEN2A syndrome which is also known as SIPPL syndrome is medullary thyroid cancer. Pituitary adenoma is not a characteristic feature of symptom complex of MEN2 and its variants, but it is observed in MEN1 and MEN4 syndrome. Meningioma is not commonly seen in MEN2B syndrome. MEN1 syndrome is associated with meningiomas. MEN4 is caused by genetic mutations in CDKN1B that is cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor which is located on chromosome 12. MEN1 is caused due to MEN1 gene mutation on chromosome 11. MEN2 is associated with RET proto-oncogene mutation on chromosome 10. 
men 4 syndrome is associated with CDKN1B gene on chromosome 12. Associated conditions of men 4 syndrome are parathyroid adenoma, pituitary adenoma, reproductive organ tumors like testicular cancer, neuroendocrine cervical carcinoma, adrenal and renal tumors. Medullary thyroid carcinoma is associated with men 2 syndrome. Next case is a patient presented with abdominal pain and swelling in his scrotum and was diagnosed to have testicular carcinoma. There is a history of men syndrome running in his family. This patient is likely to have men 4 syndrome as reproductive organ tumors are a characteristic feature of this condition. Next topic is pheochromocytoma. The clinical triad of pheochromocytoma includes the following symptoms like headache, profuse sweating, palpitation which is due to tachycardia. Hypertension is the most predominant sign of pheochromocytoma. Though intermittent hypertension is a classical feature, sustained hypertension is also common. Clinical features of pheochromocytoma by frequency of occurrence are headache, profuse sweating, palpitations and tachycardia, hypertension, anxiety, panic attacks, hyperglycemia, hypercalcemia, pallor which is due to alpha-1 mediated vasoconstriction, polyuria, polydipsia, orthostatic hypotension, dilated cardiomyopathy, erythrocytosis, high hematocrite, constipation, abdominal pain, weakness, weight loss, nausea. Hypercalcemia is seen in patients with pheochromocytoma. It is not seen in hypocalcemic patients. This is due to the production of parathyroid hormone related peptide by the tumor. Polyuria is seen in patients with pheochromocytoma. Excess catecholamine levels in this condition can cause polyuria and polydipsia due to hyperglycemia. Cafe A light spots are seen in neurofibromatosis 1, which is a pheochromocytoma associated syndrome. Pheochromocytoma associated syndromes include the following like neurofibromatosis type 1, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2, von Hippel-Lindo syndrome, paraganglioma syndrome. Malignant pheochromocytoma refers to tumors that have undergone metastasis to lymph nodes or distant sites. They are histologically and biochemically the same as benign ones. Hence, typical histological criteria like cellular atypia, mitotic spindles and capsular invasion are insufficient to confirm malignancy in pheochromocytomas. Norepinephrine is exclusively secreted in patients with extra adrenal pheochromocytoma. The phenyl ethanolamine n methyl transferase, that is PNMT enzyme, converts norepinephrine to epinephrine. This enzyme is absent in extra adrenal sites. Hence, extra adrenal pheochromocytoma secrete only norepinephrine and cannot secrete epinephrine. On the other hand, adrenal pheochromocytomas can secrete norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine in varying amounts depending on the PNMT levels in the tumor. Extra adrenal pheochromocytomas or catecholamine secreting paragangliomas are most commonly found in the abdomen. They commonly arise from the organ of Zucker Kandel. Next is a case that is a 31 year old woman is rushed to the emergency department with a severe headache and vomiting. Past history includes a total thyroidectomy for thyroid cancer 3 months ago. Her BP is 200 by 100 mmHg and pulse is 110 per minute. On examination, a morphinoid habitus is noted. This clinical scenario with a history of thyroid cancer like medullary carcinoma thyroid and mucosal neuromas points towards men 2B syndrome. Her current presentation is suggestive of pheochromocytoma. She is likely to have predominantly elevated levels of epinephrine and its metabolite metanephrine. This is due to the higher expression of the PNMT enzyme associated with the mutations in MEN2 syndrome, both 2A and 2B. The higher levels of epinephrine results in a more symptomatic presentation. In contrast, low PNMT expression is seen in von Hippel-Lindo syndrome. This leads to a predominant elevation of norepinephrine and normetanephrine levels. It is less symptomatic compared to MEN2 syndrome. Biopsy and FNAC should be avoided in patients with pheochromocytoma as it is a highly vascular tumor. CT and MRI have similar sensitivity but T2 weighted MRI with gadolinium contrast is the optimal test for diagnosis. 
MI BG scintigraphy can be used to localize the tumor if both CT and MRI are negative. Genetic testing may be performed as nearly 40% of the tumors are associated with familial syndromes like VHL, neurofibromatosis and MEN2. In case of malignant pheochromocytoma, biopsy may be indicated to confirm adrenal gland metastasis in other sites. Next case is, a middle-aged male patient is being evaluated for recurrent episodes of palpitations, headaches and profuse sweating. He was found to have elevated BP readings on multiple occasions over the past two months. The given clinical scenario is suggestive of pheochromocytoma. The measurement of 24-hour urinary fractioned metanephrins has both the highest specificity and sensitivity in the diagnosis of this condition. Imaging modalities like CT and MRI have a sensitivity of around 98 to 100% and specificity of 70%. The best method for detecting and localization of tumors associated with pheochromocytoma are fluorodopa PET scan. If biochemical testing for pheochromocytoma is positive, an abdominal MRI must be performed first. If MRI is negative or if multiple tumors are suspected, the tumor can be localized by performing one of the following investigations like 68 gallium dotatate PET scan which is the most sensitive gold standard test and next is fluorodopa and 18F fluorodeoxyglucose PET scans which is 97% sensitive. Next is MIBG syndigraphy which is least sensitive. Next case is a 45-year-old man presented with recurrent episodes of headache, palpitations and sweating. His BP at presentation was 180 by 100 mm Hg. Further testing revealed elevated urinary metanephrines. CT abdomen showed right adrenal mass. This clinical scenario is suggestive of pheochromocytoma. The drug of choice to control BP prior to surgery is oral phenoxybenzamine at 0.5 to 4 mg per kg of body weight. It is a non-specific alpha blocker and is preferred due to its long action that is 3 to 4 days. Other alpha blockers like oral prazosin and intravenous phentolamine have a shorter duration of action and can be used to manage paroxysms. IV phentolamine is also used for intraoperative management of BP. Alpha blockers are usually given for 7 days. Following this, beta blockers are started usually 2 to 3 days pre-operatively. Beta blockers should never be started first because blockade of vasodilatory peripheral beta receptors with unopposed alpha receptor stimulation can lead to a further elevation in BP. Beta blockers like atenolol should never be used as initial drug or alone in the management of pheochromocytoma. They must be given only after adequate alpha blockade which has been established. Blocking beta receptors may cause unopposed stimulation of alpha receptors, precipitating a hypertensive crisis. Prazosin is an alpha blocker. Nitroprusside can be used in case of hypertensive emergencies. Metyrosin inhibits catecholamin synthesis. It can be used when other agents have been ineffective. Averboot's chemotherapy protocol for malignant pheochromocytoma includes dacarbazin that is 600mg per meter square on days 1 and 2, cyclophosphamide that is 750mg per meter square on day 1, vincristin that is 1.4mg per meter square on day 1, all repeated every 21 days for 3 to 6 cycles. Iodine-131 MIBG that is meta-iodobenzyl guanidine. Iodine-131 MIBG is used for the treatment of malignant pheochromocytoma. Malignant pheochromocytomas occur in 10% of the cases and are histologically and biochemically the same as benign ones. The diagnosis of malignant pheochromocytoma is based on documentation of metastatic disease. The treatment of choice is nuclear medicine therapy with any of the following like iodine-131 MIBG at 200 MCI doses at monthly intervals that is 3 to 6 cycles or dotatoc that is it is a somatostatin receptor analog which is labeled with radioactive lutetium or vitrium. Chemotherapy can also be given according to Averboot's protocol. Iodine-123 MIBG and gallium dotatate are used for imaging. The most common cause of Cushing syndrome is iatrogenic due to administration of corticosteroids. Causes of Cushing syndromes include 
exogenous causes or iatrogenic causes like prolonged administration of glucocorticoids, endogenous causes like ACTH dependent that is primary hypercortisolism, adrenocortical adenoma, adrenocortical carcinoma, bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. ACTH dependent that is secondary hypercortisolism like Cushing's disease, paraneoplastic causes. Cushing's disease, there is ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma which is the most common cause of endogenous Cushing's disease. Paraneoplastic causes include ectopic ACTH secreting tumors like small cell carcinoma, bronchial or pancreatic carcinoid tumors, medullary thyroid carcinoma, pheochromocytoma. Rare causes of Cushing's syndrome include macronodular adrenal hyperplasia, primary pigmented nodular adrenal disease, mccune albright syndrome. Cushing's disease causes ACTH dependent Cushing's syndrome. It occurs due to an ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma. Cushing syndrome is rarely associated with Menwin syndrome. Bronchial carcinoids are a source of ectopic ACTH secretion resulting in ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome. Clinical features of Cushing syndrome are attributed to the glucocorticoid, mineralocorticoid and sex steroid actions of cortisol. Clinical features are central or trungal obesity which is the most common feature, buffalo hump that is fat deposition behind the neck, moon facies, purple striae over abdomen and flanks, acne and hirsutism, easy bruising, facial plethora, hyperpigmentation, proximal myopathy, osteoporosis, poorly controlled hyperglycemia, dyslipidemia, oligomenorrhea, amenorrhea, hypokalemic alkalosis, atherosclerosis, diastolic hypertension, edema, hypercoagulable state, lymphopenia, neutrophilia, eosinophilia, depression, psychosis, anxiety. These all are the clinical features of Cushing syndrome. Proximal myopathy is commonly seen in Cushing syndrome, not distal myopathy. Cushing's disease and all other causes of Cushing syndrome can result in a hypercoagulable state. This is due to an increase in procoagulant factors and inhibition of fibrinolysis. Cushing's disease is a form of Cushing syndrome caused by ACTH secreting pituitary tumor. The high ACTH levels stimulate melanocytes and cause skin hyperpigmentation. It is especially seen over friction prone areas like knuckles, elbows. The majority of patients with Cushing syndrome have psychiatric symptoms such as anxiety, depression, frank psychosis. Mineralic corticoid action of cortisol may lead to diastolic hypertension, hypokalemia and edema. Next is a case. A 28-year-old woman visits a gynecologist with complaints of irregular and infrequent menstrual cycles. She is also upset that she has gained 12 kg over the past few months. Her BP at the visit is 144 by 98 mm Hg and she has multiple purple striae over her abdomen. This clinical scenario along with the uh, patient showing moon facies and acne and also hirsutism are suggestive of Cushing syndrome. It can be diagnosed with the help of a single midnight serum cortisol measurement. Cosentropin stimulation test is used for the diagnosis of Addison's disease. Test to detect hypercortisolism are Midnight salivary or serum cortisol level, that is the presence of cortisol in the saliva or serum at midnight signifies loss of diurnal variation of cortisol. Next is 24-hour urinary free cortisol excretion, that is it is increased 3 times the normal value. Next is overnight dexamethasone suppression test, that is plasma cortisol more than 1.8 microgram per deciliter at 8 am after overnight exposure to dexamethasone, that is 1 mg given at 11 pm. Low dose dexamethasone suppression test is, it is highly specific test, plasma cortisol more than 1.8 microgram per dl at 8 am on the third day after giving 0.5 mg dexamethasone every 6 hours for 2 days. Next is test to rule out pseudo Cushing syndrome. Here low dose dexamethasone suppression test and also CR stimulation test is done. That is plasma cortisol levels are increased in true Cushing syndrome but remain unaffected in pseudo Cushing syndrome. Dexa induced negative feedback is overcome by CRH in true Cushing's. Determination of plasma ACTH level is not advised as a screening test for patient with Cushing syndrome. Plasma ACTH determination is done to distinguish between ACTH dependent and independent causes. It is done after the screening or confirmation of Cushing syndrome. 
ബേസൽ പ്ലാസ്മ എ സി ടി എച്ച് ലെവൽസ് ആർ ഹയ്യസ്റ്റ് ഇൻ എക്ടോപിക് എ സി ടി എച്ച് സെക്രേറ്റിംഗ് ട്യൂമേഴ്സ് പ്ലാസ്മ എ സി ടി എച്ച് മോർ ദാൻ ഫിഫ്റ്റീൻ പൈക്കോഗ്രാം പെർ മില്ലി ലിറ്റർ ഇസ് സജസ്റ്റീവ് ഓഫ് എ സി ടി എച്ച് ഡിപ്പെൻഡൻറ്റ് കുഷിംഗ് സിൻഡ്രോം വിച്ച് ഇസ് ഡ്യൂ ടു പിറ്റ്യൂട്രി ഓർ എക്ടോപിക് സോഴ്സസ് ബേസൽ എ സി ടി എച്ച് ഇൻ പിറ്റ്യൂട്രി അഡിനോമ കൻ ബി നോർമൽ ഓർ എൽവേറ്റഡ് വെറസ് ഇൻ ആൻ എക്ടോപിക് സോഴ്സ് ഓഫ് എ സി ടി എച്ച് പ്രൊഡക്ഷൻ ഇസ് വെരി ഹൈ This occurs because a pituitary adenoma retains some sensitivity to the negative feedback mechanism exerted by cortisol but ectopic tumors remain unaffected plasma acth less than 5 picogram per milliliter is suggestive of acth independent cushing syndrome that can be caused by adrenal adenoma or exogenous administration of glucocorticoids an elevated acth level is suggestive of acth dependent cushing syndrome the investigation of choice for acth dependent cushing syndrome is mri brain to look for the presence of pituitary tumor if the mri brain shows a mass it is suggestive of pituitary mass of more than 6 mm in size however if the mri brain does not show a mass it suggests a pituitary tumor of less than 6 mm in size or an ectopic acth source ഹൈ ഡോസ് ഡെക്സ മെത്തസോൺ സപ്രഷൻ ടെസ്റ്റ് ആൻഡ് സി ആർ എച്ച് സ്റ്റിമുലേഷൻ ടെസ്റ്റ് ആർ എംപ്ലോയിഡ് ടു ഡിഫറൻഷിയേറ്റ് പിറ്റ്യൂട്രി ഫ്രം എക്ടോപിക് എ സി ടി എച്ച് സിൻഡ്രോം എ ഡെഫിനറ്റ് കോസ് കാൻ ബി എസ്റ്റാബ്ലിഷ്ഡ് ഓൺലി ബൈ ഇമേജിംഗ് ടെക്നിക്സ് ലൈക്ക് എം ആർ ഐ ഫോർ പിറ്റ്യൂട്രി ട്യൂമേഴ്സ് സി ടി സ്കാൻ ഓഫ് ദ ചെസ്റ്റ് ആൻഡ് എബ്ഡോമൻ ഫോർ എക്ടോപിക് എ സി ടി എച്ച് സൈറ്റ്സ് ഹെൻസ് എം ആർ ഐ ഇസ് കൺസിഡേർഡ് ദ ഇൻവെസ്റ്റിഗേഷൻ ഓഫ് ചോയ്സ് നെക്സ്റ്റ് ഇസ് എ കേസ് എ ഫിഫ്റ്റി സിക്സ് ഇയർ ഓൾഡ് മാൻ ക്രോണിക് സ്മോക്കർ പ്രസൻറ്റഡ് വിത്ത് ഫ്ലെക്സ് ഓഫ് ബ്ലഡ് ഇൻ ഹിസ് പ്യൂട്ടം ഹി ഇസ് കറൻറ്റ്ലി ഓൺ ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് ഫോർ സി ഒ പി ഡി ആൻഡ് ഹൈപ്പർ ടെൻഷൻ ഹിസ് ബി എം ഐ ഇസ് തേർട്ടി വൺ കിലോഗ്രാം പെർ മീറ്റർ സ്ക്വയർ ആൻഡ് ഹി ഹാസ് സെൻട്രൽ ഒബീസിറ്റി ഹിസ് റാൻഡം ബ്ലഡ് ഷുഗർ ഇസ് ടു സിക്സ്റ്റി വൺ മില്ലി ഗ്രാം പെർ ഡെസി ലിറ്റർ ഡൂയിങ് ഫർദർ ഇവാലുവേഷൻ ഹി ഇസ് ഫൗണ്ട് ടു ഹാവ് ഹൈ എ സി ടി എച്ച് ലെവൽസ് ദറ്റ് റിമൈൻഡ് ഹൈ ഈവൻ ആഫ്റ്റർ അഡ്മിനിസ്ട്രേഷൻ ഓഫ് ഹൈഡോസ് ഡെക്സാ മെത്തസോൺ elevated acth levels that do not get suppressed by a high dose dexamethasone test are suggestive of cushing syndrome secondary to an ectopic acth secreting tumor considering the patient's smoking history and presentation with hemoptysis it is likely to be a lung tumor ectopic sources of acth include small cell lung cancers and pulmonary carcinoid tumors The most effective treatment strategy is the management of the underlying small cell lung cancer or carcinoid. Evaluation of patient with Cushing syndrome reveals high ACTH levels that are responsive to CRH and suppressed by high dose dexamethasone. In this case, CRH responsiveness is seen only in ACTH dependent hypercortisolism which is due to pituitary cause. This is because the pituitary tumor contains corticotrophic cells that are responsive to CRH. In pituitary adenoma high dose dexamethasone suppression test is positive in pituitary adenoma crh stimulation test is positive in ectopic acth high dose dexamethasone suppression test is negative in ectopic acth crh stimulation test is negative iatrogenic means suppressed acth levels that are not affected by dynamic testing in case of adrenal mass or hyperplasia suppressed acth levels that are not affected by dynamic testing Next case is a 50 year old woman was diagnosed with ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome as MRI of the pituitary was normal and further testing was unequivocal she was scheduled for inferior pituitary sinus sampling it revealed a baseline pituitary is to peripheral ACTH ratio more than 2 Cushing syndrome with pituitary is to peripheral ACTH ratio more than 2 at baseline confirms the presence of an ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma the treatment of choice is transphenoidal pituitary surgery radiotherapy is used in case of recurrence of tumors inferior pituitary sinus sampling is performed to differentiate pituitary and ectopic source of ACTH when initial imaging and testing are inconclusive Drugs used in the treatment of Cushing syndrome include metirapone, ketoconazole, aminoglutathione, trilostane, ciproheptadine, mitotane, etomidate. Mitotane is mainly used in adrenal carcinoma. Etomidate is used in severe cortisol excess. Mitotane is used in the management of adrenocortical carcinoma due to its adrenolytic properties. Mitotane is an insecticide derivative. It is effective in the treatment of benign Cushing's also, but it is rarely used due to its side effects. Nelson syndrome is a rare complication of total bilateral adrenalectomy. 
total bilateral adrenalectomy is a procedure used to control hypercortisolism in Cushing's disease due to ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma when resection of the primary tumor is not possible. The loss of feedback inhibition of hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis following the total bilateral adrenalectomy increases CRH. This leads to stimulation of ACTH secreting corticotroph cells causing enlargement of the original pituitary tumor or the formation of a new one. Nelson syndrome is associated with clinical triad of hyperpigmentation, excessive ACTH secretion, corticotroph adenoma. Screening is done with fasting plasma ACTH levels and MRI brain is performed at regular intervals. Prophylactic pituitary irradiation may be recommended to prevent its incidence. The primary treatment is transpenoidal surgery. Patient will also require lifelong glucocorticoid replacement as they do not produce cortisol. The use of steroidogenic inhibitors in the treatment of Cushing's disease has decreased the need for bilateral adrenalectomy these days. Sheehan syndrome refers to postpartum hypopituitarism that is caused by ischemic necrosis of the anterior pituitary as a result of severe postpartum hemorrhage. Addison's disease occurs due to autoimmune destruction of adrenal glands. waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome refers to adrenal apoplexy that is caused by fulminant meningococcemia. Malignancy does not cause pseudo-Cushing syndrome. It may cause ectopic ACTH production leading to true Cushing syndrome. Pseudo-Cushing syndrome refers to functional hypercortisolism caused by chronic activation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. It presents with clinical and biochemical features similar to Cushing syndrome, making it difficult to differentiate between them. It may occur secondary to the following conditions like severe major depressive disorder, polycystic ovarian syndrome, insulin-resistant obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, chronic alcoholism, and end-stage renal disease. It usually resolves when the underlying condition is treated. Addison's disease occurs due to autoimmune adrenalitis. It is the most common etiology of primary adrenal insufficiency. Tuberculosis is the most common cause of adrenal insufficiency in India and other developing countries. Idiopathic atrophy due to autoimmune condition is the most common cause in developed countries. Elevated ACTH and reduced cortisol levels are seen in primary adrenal insufficiency. It is not a feature of men for syndrome. The following symptoms associated with primary adrenal insufficiency are autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1, autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 2, triple A syndrome, smith lemley opitz syndrome, cairn sayre syndrome, image syndrome. Next is a case. 50-year-old woman was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and started on levothyroxine two weeks ago. She now presents to your clinic with abdominal pain and dizziness. Patient shows skin hyperpigmentation. This clinical picture in a patient with severe dizziness and history of autoimmune thyroiditis points to a diagnosis of Addison's disease. Hyperglycemia is not a feature of this condition. Clinical features of Addison's disease include abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, salt craving, dizziness, postural hypotension, acute kidney injury due to volume depletion, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, anorexia, weight loss, fatigue, myalgia, arthralgia, fever, depression, postural hypotension, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, slightly increased TSH, loss of libido, loss of pubic and axillary hair, hyperpigmentation. Levothyroxine can precipitate adrenal insufficiency or crisis in undiagnosed patients. In patients with concurrent adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism, a course of steroids must be given before giving thyroid replacement. Hyponatremia is the most common biochemical abnormality seen at presentation in patients with adrenal insufficiency. It is observed in 80% of the patients at presentation. Hyponatremia is caused by mineralocorticoid deficiency, diminished inhibition of ADH release by cortisol resulting in mild SIADH during secondary adrenal insufficiency. Hyperkalemia is diagnosed in 40% of the patients during initial diagnosis. Next case is a 27-year-old woman is brought to the casualty with severe abdominal pain, vomiting and diarrhea for the past three days. She has been excessively tired and dizzy for the past two weeks. 
On examination, there are patches of hyperpigmented skin. BP is 70 by 40 mm Hg and blood glucose is 50 mg per deciliter. This clinical scenario is suggestive of adrenal insufficiency. The confirmatory test for diagnosis is ACTH stimulation test or short cosyntropin stimulation test. Hyponatremia and hyperkalemia are seen. Plasma levels of ACTH, renin and aldosterone are used to differentiate between primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency. Next case is a 20-year-old woman is being evaluated for adrenal insufficiency. Use decide to check her serum levels of ACTH, renin and aldosterone. Pituitary MRI is indicated in secondary adrenal insufficiency which presents with following parameters like normal renin level, normal aldosterone level, low normal ACTH level. The following findings are seen in primary adrenal insufficiency. They are high ACTH level, high renin, low aldosterone levels. Next case is a 33-year-old man collapses during a family vacation. At the hospital, BP is found to be 86 by 52 mm Hg and random blood sugar is 49 mg per deciliter. His wife says that he has been on treatment for Addison's disease two years back and for he had forgotten to pack his medication for the trip. Here in this clinical scenario is suggestive of an adrenal crisis triggered by missed medication. In this patient who is a known case of adrenal insufficiency, IV hydrocortisone is the drug of choice. However, in patients with newly diagnosed adrenal insufficiency, dexamethasone is used for the treatment of adrenal crisis. This is because dexamethasone is not measured in cortisol assays and would not interfere with the diagnostic test, whereas hydrocortisone interferes with cortisol assays. Dexamethasone is a long-acting steroid with purely glucocorticoid action. It has no effect on hyperkalemia, which is mediated by mineralocorticoids. Dexamethasone is used in patients with newly diagnosed adrenal insufficiency as it does not interfere with serum cortisol measurement. Addison's disease consists of hypoaldosteronism, hypocortisolism, hypoandrogenism, elevated ACTH levels. Next case is a 62-year-old woman who was diagnosed with non-functioning pituitary adenoma develops features of adrenal insufficiency. Here, a non-functioning pituitary adenoma causes hypopituitarism due to compression of the pituitary stalk. This results in secondary adrenal insufficiency. This condition is characterized by an alabaster-like paleness due to the lack of ACTH secretion. In primary adrenal insufficiency, hyperpigmentation occurs as a result of elevated ACTH. In this case, the features we can see is postural hypotension, hypoglycemia, lassitude. Bilateral adrenal hyperplasia is the most common cause of mineralocorticoid excess. It causes primary hyperaldosteronism. Other causes of primary hyperaldosteronism are Korn syndrome that is unilateral adrenal adenoma, glucocorticoid that is remediable hyperaldosteronism. Other causes of mineralocorticoid excess are as follows like congenital adrenal hyperplasia, syndrome of apparent mineralocorticoid excess that is SAME, adrenocortical carcinoma, Cushing syndrome, progesterone induced hypertension. Liddell syndrome is due to mutation of INAC subunits. This results in reduced degradation of INAC channels causing prolonged mineralocorticoid action. In Korn syndrome, even though there is volume expansion, an underlying salt escape mechanism leads to the absence of pedal edema. The volume expansion due to hypernatremia leads to right heart dilatation that stimulates the release of atrial natriuretic peptide. This leads to compensatory diuresis and lack of edema despite sodium retention. Features of primary hyperaldosteronism are hypokalemia, hypertension, metabolic alkalosis, polyuria due to ANP, polydipsia which is a consequence of polyuria, muscle weakness. Next case is a 39 year old man is referred for evaluation of severe hypertension that has not improved despite being on three antihypertensive drugs. The presence of decreased plasma renin activity in this patient will point out to the diagnosis of Korn syndrome. Korn syndrome is a cause of primary hyperaldosteronism that presents with hypertension and low levels of renin. 
elevated aldosterone levels cause negative feedback in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and results in decreased renin production Hypokalemic hypertension is suggestive of hyperaldosteronism. The screening test of choice is a measurement of plasma renin and aldosterone levels to calculate aldosterone renin ratio. Aldosterone renin ratio must be estimated in patients with hypertension and any of the following features like drug resistance, hypokalemia, adrenal mass and onset before 40 years of age. Prior to the determination of aldosterone renin ratio, hypokalemia correction must be done. If the patient is on spironolactone, it must be stopped 4 weeks prior to testing. Other blood pressure medication can be continued. If aldosterone renin ratio is positive, CT abdomen and adrenal vein sampling are used for confirmation of diagnosis. An elevated aldosterone renin ratio is indicative of primary hyperaldosteronism. Me tyropon stimulation test is used in the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency. A failure of suppression of aldosterone levels below 140 picomol per liter indicates autonomous aldosterone production, which is the hallmark of primary hyperaldosteronism. This principle is used in the following tests like saline infusion test, oral sodium loading test as well as fludrocortisone suppression test. These tests may be used to confirm the diagnosis in patients with elevated aldosterone renin ratio but are not necessary in case of overt hypokalemic hypertension, strongly positive aldosterone renin ratio and high aldosterone. 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency is associated with metabolic alkalosis. It is a rare form of congenital adrenal hyperplasia that presents with the following features like glucocorticoid deficiency which include hypoglycemia, hyperpigmentation around the genitals due to excess adrenocorticotrophic hormone secretion. Next is mineralocorticoid excess which includes hypokalemia, hypertension, metabolic alkalosis. Adrenal androgen excess that is by virilization in females and precocious puberty in males. In 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, aldosterone synthetic capacity is normal and some corticosterone is synthesized from progesterone by intact aldosterone synthase enzyme. Thus, it is unusual for patients to manifest signs of adrenal insufficiency. Next is a case that is a neonate with ambiguous genitalia undergoes karyotyping and is confirmed to have 46XY genotype. His BP is 140 by 80 mmHg and serum potassium is 1.9 milli equivalents per liter. This clinical scenario with ambiguous genitalia in a male neonate is suggestive of 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency. It causes hypertension and hypokalemia due to accumulation of 11 deoxycorticosterone, which is a mineralocorticoid causing sodium retention. 11 hydroxylase deficiency also leads to the accumulation of 11 deoxycorticosterone. Now, discussing about the variants of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Starting with 21 hydroxylase deficiency, it is the deficiency of cortisol and aldosterone. There will be increase in testosterone. Salt wasting crisis is seen here. Virilization of females that is ambiguous genitalia 46XX. Precocious puberty in males are seen. Next is 17 hydroxylase deficiency. Here there is deficiency of cortisol and sex hormones. Increase in aldosterone is seen. Salt retention and hypertension is seen. Failure of sexual development in females at puberty is seen. Males are incompletely virilized, that is ambiguous genitalia 46XY is seen. Next, talking about 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, there is deficiency of cortisol, increase in deoxycorticosterone and testosterone, salt retention and hypertension is seen, virilization of females, that is ambiguous genitalia 46XX is seen, precocious puberty in males are seen. Next is 3 beta HSD deficiency. That is deficiency of cortisol, aldosterone and testosterone. There will be increase in DHEA. Salt wasting crisis is seen here. Females are mildly virilized. That is DHEA is a weak androgen. Males are incompletely virilized. That is ambiguous genitalia 46XY is seen here. Hypoglycemia is a feature of salt wasting congenital adrenal hyperplasia. It is due to 21 hydroxylase deficiency. It results in hyponatremia, hyperkalemia and hypotension. 
males typically present with salt wasting crisis as they often go undiagnosed at birth due to the presence of normal genitalia the drug of choice for the prenatal treatment of congenital adrenal hyperplasia due to 21 hydroxylase deficiency is dexamethasone as it readily crosses the placenta it is an experimental approach aimed at reducing the virilization of 46 xx fetuses by suppressing fetal adrenal steroid and androgen secretion it may be considered when there is a high risk of cah due to strong family history it is effective only when started before 4 weeks of gestation Next case is a female neonate is noted to have ambiguous genitalia at birth further testing reveals elevated 17 hydroxylase progesterone levels and a blood glucose of 40 mg per deciliter in this case patient is having ambiguous genitalia as well as elevated 17 hydroxylase progesterone and hypoglycemia so this is suggestive of 21 hydroxylase deficiency the drug of choice is hydrocortisone Hydrocortisone acts as a potent glucocorticoid with mineralocorticoid action and thus increases salt absorption from the kidneys as well. Beta-methasone, beclomethasone and dexamethasone have negligible effects as mineralocorticoids. Galactoria or pathological production of milk is not associated with lactation which is a physiological condition. Galactoria is the inappropriate discharge of milk containing fluid from the breast. It may be unilateral or bilateral. It is associated with acromegaly and hyperprolactinemia. Treatment is with dopamine agonist like bromocryptin or cabergolin if it is due to hyperprolactinemia. Determination of prolactin level is not useful in patients with gynecomastia. For the diagnosis of gynecomastia, serum levels of the following hormones must be checked. They are testosterone, LH, FSH, estradiol, hCG. Next case is a 32-year-old man is being evaluated for gynecomastia. Lab investigations showed low level of serum testosterone and LH. This clinical scenario of gynecomastia with low LH and testosterone is suggestive of Sertoli cell tumor. Hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism is also a possible diagnosis with the above clinical presentation and must be ruled out before diagnosing a Sertoli cell tumor. The differential diagnosis of gynecomastia is as follows like high LH and low testosterone is seen in testicular failure. low lh and low testosterone is seen in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism sertoli cell tumor we can see increased primary estrogen production high lh and high testosterone is seen in androgen resistant state as well as gnr it secreting tumor next case is a mother brings her 17 year old daughter to the gynecologist as she has not started menstruation yet examination reveals well developed breast and the absence of pubic and axillary hair Pelvic examination reveals a short blind ended vagina. The given clinical scenario is suggestive of complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. Clinical features are female phenotype, normal breast development, blind ended vagina with absent uterus and ovaries, presence of testes in the abdomen or inguinal region, scanty pubic and axillary hair, primary amenorrhea in late adolescence. Interner syndrome breasts are infantile. Steen Leventhal syndrome or polycystic ovarian disorder presents with hirsutism and anovulatory menstrual cycles. Premature ovarian failure presents with secondary amenorrhea. Next case is a baby girl is referred to a pediatric surgeon for suspected bilateral inguinal hernias. Further evaluation reveals mass to be testes in the inguinal canal. Here in this clinical picture which is suggestive of androgen insensitivity syndrome affected children have a male karyotype or 46xy with a female phenotype 46xy individuals with complete ais that is testicular feminization syndrome or androgen insensitivity syndrome have the following features like female phenotype normal breast development blind ended vagina with absent uterus and ovaries scanty pubic and axillary hair Most patients present with inguinal mass in infancy which is due to undescended testes or hernias containing testes primary amenorrhea in late adolescence gonadectomy is a recommended course of treatment due to the possible risk of malignancy next case is 18 year old boy is brought to casualty with minor burns following a house fire 
he tells you that he did not even smell the smoke further probing reveals a history of bilateral orchidopexy at the age of 7 examination findings include unicoid habitus prepubertal testis and microphallus here in this case anosmia and absent secondary sexual characteristic in this patient are suggestive of kelman syndrome it is an x linked disorder that causes isolated hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism due to defective development of the olfactory bulb this results in defective migration of gnrh producing neurons that originate from the olfactory epithelium and also aplasia or hypoplasia of olfactory bulb the clinical features include cryptorchidism absent or delayed pubertal changes due to gnrh deficiency anosmia or hyposmia the most common cause of hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism in males is klinefelter syndrome it occurs in males with a 47 xxy karyotype and is associated with testicular dysfunction and male infertility causes of hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism in males and females are congenital causes like klinefelter syndrome turner syndrome soyer syndrome premature ovarian failure associated with fragile x syndrome and galactosemia acute causes are mumps orchitis testicular torsion trauma liver cirrhosis ketoconazole premature ovarian failure Gonadectomy is clinically recommended in all patients with androgen insensitivity syndrome or testicular feminization syndrome due to the risk of malignancy arising from the abnormally located testes. Next case is a 19 year old patient is being evaluated for primary amenorrhea. Lab investigations reveals decreased estrogen FS and LH. Decreased levels of estrogen FSH and LH are suggestive of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism which is caused by Kalman syndrome. It is an X-linked disorder that causes isolated hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism and anosmia. The gene affected is Cal gene. Causes of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism include congenital causes like Kalman syndrome, isolated hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, Prader-Willi syndrome, charge syndrome. Acute causes are pituitary tumors, apoplexy, hyperprolactinemia, anorexia nervosa, excess exercise, irradiation, infection, trauma. Asherman syndrome causes secondary amenorrhea due to intrauterine synecdoche. Mullerian agenesis presents with primary amenorrhea with normal levels of all hormones. Turner syndrome causes primary amenorrhea due to hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism. Hypercalcemia is associated with multiple myeloma, hyperparathyroidism, sarcoidosis as well as hyperthyroidism. Causes of hypercalcemia are parathyroid related causes are primary hyperparathyroidism by adenomas, multiple endocrine neoplasia as well as carcinoma. Other causes are lithium therapy, familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. Malignancy related causes are solid tumor with metastasis example breast solid tumor with humeral mediation of hypercalcemia example lung and kidney hematological malignancies like multiple myeloma lymphoma leukemia vitamin d related causes like vitamin d intoxication sarcoidosis and other granulomatous disease Hypercalcemia is associated with high bone turnover like hyperthyroidism, immobilization, thiazides, vitamin A intoxication, fat necrosis. Hypercalcemia is associated with renal failure like severe secondary hyperparathyroidism, milk alkali syndrome, aluminium intoxication. Vitamin A intoxication can cause hypercalcemia. This is due to high bone turnover. Ingestion of 50,000 to 1 lakh units of vitamin A daily can increase calcium levels up to 12 to 14 mg per deciliter. Vitamin D intoxication also leads to hypercalcemia. Next is a case. A 66-year-old woman is brought to the emergency department after being found unconscious by her neighbors. She is found to have marked dehydration and serum calcium level of 16 mg per deciliter. This clinical scenario with severe hypercalcemia more than 14.8 mg per deciliter is suggestive of hypercalcemic crisis. Pancreatitis causes hypocalcemia, not hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemic crisis is often caused by malignancies due to an acute rise in calcium levels following bone resorption due to metastasis. 
it is a medical emergency that presents with oliguria, severe dehydration, gastrointestinal symptoms and altered consciousness. It can lead to cardiac arrest and coma. Hypercalcemia is associated with constipation. Clinical manifestations of hypercalcemia are renal stones that is calcium oxalate stone more than calcium phosphate, nephrocalcinosis, polyuria and dehydration, renal failure, bone pain, bone cyst, myalgia, arthralgia, osteopenia, osteoporosis, constipation, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, abdominal pain, peptic ulcer disease, acute pancreatitis, anxiety, depression, fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, drowsiness, obtentation, coma, short QT interval, bradycardia, hypertension, ectopic calcification. These all are the clinical manifestations of hypercalcemia. The clinical signs associated with primary hyperparathyroidism can be remembered with the mnemonic stones, bones, abdominal groins, psychic moans. Excess calcium ingestion is not associated with restrictive cardiomyopathy. It results in milk alkali syndrome commonly associated with excessive intake of absorbable antacids such as milk or calcium carbonate. In susceptible individuals, there is a loss of negative feedback leading to excess calcium absorption when there is excess intake. It results in the following triad of clinical features like hypercalcemia, alkalosis, which is due to HCO3 reabsorption caused by PTH suppression, natriuresis and water depletion, renal failure which is due to damage to renal tubules. It is reversible once ingestion of antacid is stopped. However, in severe cases, a chronic form called Burnett syndrome can develop. It is associated with irreversible renal damage. Parathyroid adenomas are the most common cause of primary hyperparathyroidism. Causes of primary hyperparathyroidism are Parathyroid adenomas. These may be solitary, multiple and also part of MEN1, MEN2, A or MEN2, 4 are present here. Next cause is chief cell parathyroid hyperplasia, parathyroid gland carcinoma, lithium use, hyperparathyroidism, jaw tumor syndrome. Next is in short about parathyroid diseases. Parathyroid diseases consist of primary hyperparathyroidism, secondary hyperparathyroidism, true hypoparathyroidism, PTH independent hypercalcemia. First of all, Primary hyperparathyroidism includes parathyroid adenoma, chief cell parathyroid hyperplasia, parathyroid gland carcinoma. Secondary hyperparathyroidism include chronic kidney disease, vitamin D deficiency, gastrointestinal malabsorption. True hypoparathyroidism include iatrogenic, autoimmune as well as digot syndrome. PTH independent hypercalcemia include malignancy, vitamin D related PTH independent hypercalcemia, Excessive calcium intake. Secondary hyperparathyroidism presents with decreased calcium and increased levels of PTH, phosphate and ALP. In this condition, calcium deficiency leads to reactive stimulation of the parathyroid. It is caused by chronic kidney disease, vitamin D deficiency, gastrointestinal malabsorption, liver disease. Primary hyperparathyroidism causes shortening of QT interval. The asymptomatic form is the most common presentation in the western population. But in developing countries, the patients are usually symptomatic. The classical symptoms and signs of PHPT, that is primary hyperparathyroidism, are due to hypercalcemia as well as increased parathyroid hormone levels. The clinical features of hypercalcemia was discussed before. Ectopic calcification is also seen due to hypercalcemia. It is presenting as... Band keratopathy in cornea, extravascular tissues we can see calcinosis, in small arteries we can see calciphylaxis. The features of elevated PTH levels are as follows, ostitis fibrosa cystica, osteopenia, osteoporosis, hyperuricemia and gout, pseudogout, increased production of calcitriol, nephrolithiasis, hypophosphatemia, anemia. Neuropsychiatric changes are seen in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. Calcitonin levels are increased in hyperparathyroidism. Calcitonin is secreted by the parafollicular C cells of the thyroid gland. Its principal effects are to lower serum calcium and phosphate by its action on bone and kidney. In bone, calcitonin inhibits osteoclast and reduces bone resorption. 
in the kidney it inhibits reabsorption of both calcium and phosphate in hyperparathyroidism due to elevated pth levels there is osteoclast activation this leads to increased calcium levels in plasma this leads to increased calcitonin levels to regulate calcium levels in plasma on taking an x ray showing rugger jersey spine which is a distinct feature of hyperparathyroidism it is mainly associated with elevated alp it refers to the prominent hyperdensities at the end plates of successive vertebrae which mimics the striped appearance of a rugby jersey Paget's disease causes cortical thickening which results in increased opacity on all sides of the vertebral body. These are called picture frame vertebrae. Osteopetrosis presents with normal ALP levels. It results in sclerotic end plates of vertebrae that are termed sandwich vertebrae. Though this finding is similar to rugger jersey spine, it is denser and more sharply defined than rugger jersey spine. In addition there is sclerosis of inner margin of vertebral bodies resulting in a bone within a bone appearance ankylosing spondylitis produces a bamboo spine appearance due to the fusion of vertebral bodies next is a case presentation a middle aged woman presents with worsening pain and an inability to bear weight on her left leg she says that she had banged her leg against a chair 3 days ago x ray reveals a fracture of her left tibia In view of this finding a skeletal survey was performed this clinical scenario is suggestive of pathological fracture of tibia the x-ray showed brown tumors or osteitis fibrosa cystica which are characteristic of hyperparathyroidism in acromegaly we can see arrow headed fingers or spade phalanx sign in x-ray acromegaly is the result of excessive growth hormone production most commonly from a macro adenoma of the pituitary There is osseous enlargement presenting with spade like hands and widening of the terminal phalangeal tuft giving an arrow head appearance other features in the hand include widened joint space due to cartilage hypertrophy generalized osteoporosis and cystic changes in the carpal bones hyperparathyroidism causes subperiosteal bone resorption which is marked along the radial aspect of the middle phalanges of the index and middle fingers Down syndrome can cause hypoplasia of the middle phalanx of the fifth finger. Psoriasis causes pencil in cup appearance of the distal phalanx. Glucocorticoids have no effect on the serum calcium concentration in primary hyperparathyroidism and normal individuals. They are effective in the treatment of hypercalcemia when associated with the following conditions like malignancy, sarcoidosis, vitamin D intoxication. Initial medical management of hypercalcemia involves the following first is normal saline that is 200 to 500 ml per hour it is the mainstay treatment to correct dehydration and titrated to maintain a urine output of more than 100 ml per hour pamidronate or zolidronate these are bisphosphonates and are considered as the drug of choice in primary hyperparathyroidism next is sinacalcet This is a calcium mimetic that increases the affinity of the glands to extracellular calcium thereby decreasing parathyroid hormone secretion. Next is denosumab. This inhibits rank ligand which acts on osteoclast. Next is calcitonin. This is an activated vitamin D analog that may be used to reduce calcium levels. It should be used within first 24 hours. Forced diuresis refers to aggressive fluid hydration with loop diuretic administration. Although this is an effective method to reduce calcium levels, it requires careful monitoring for adverse effects like fluid overload, hypokalemia and hypomagnesia. Due to this reason as well as the availability of more effective treatment modalities, forced diuresis is not preferred any longer. The definitive management of primary hyperparathyroidism is the surgical removal of parathyroid gland. Dexamethasone is used in the treatment of hypercalcemia caused by the following like vitamin D toxicity, sarcoidosis, humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy which is due to PTHRP. Steroids decrease plasma calcium levels by blocking calcitriol production. This results in reduced intestinal calcium absorption and increased urinary excretion of calcium. Vitamin D toxicity presents acutely with features of hypercalcemia such as confusion, polyuria, polydipsia, anorexia, vomiting and muscle weakness. Chronic intoxication may cause nephrocalcinosis, bone demineralization and pain. 
The following lab values are seen as elevated 25 hydroxylase dehydrogenase, high calcium and suppressed PTH. The main management modalities involve treating hypercalcemia. Next is a case. A patient is brought to the emergency department with confusion, drowsiness and multiple episodes of vomiting. His family members say that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder several years ago and has been on medication ever since. Further evaluation reveals a serum calcium level of 16 mg per deciliter. This clinical scenario is suggestive of hypercalcemic crisis. The next best step in management is saline hydration. Typically, 200 to 500 milliliter per hour fluids are given to correct dehydration and titrated to maintain a urine output of more than 100 milliliter per hour. Hypercalcemic crisis is a medical emergency associated with serum calcium more than 14 mg per deciliter. It is often caused by conditions causing an acute rise in calcium levels such as malignancies or lithium overdose. It presents with oliguria, severe dehydration, gastrointestinal symptoms and altered consciousness. It can lead to cardiac arrest and coma. Initial medical management of hypercalcemia involves the following like fluids are the mainstay of treatment, bisphosphonates, sinacalcet, dinosumab, calcitonin, these all are the medical management. Vitamin D dependent rickets type 1 is associated with hypocalcemia and hypophosphatemia. Hypocalcemia with hyperphosphatemia is observed in the following conditions like pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, chronic kidney disease, digeot syndrome, true hypoparathyroidism in case of hereditary hypoparathyroidism, acute hypoparathyroidism following surgery, hypomagnesemia. Pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism is a type of pseudo-hypoparathyroidism type 1A associated with normal calcium and normal phosphate. The clinical features are similar to pseudo-hypoparathyroidism but there is no PTH resistance. Pseudo-hypoparathyroidism is an autosomal dominant condition caused by mutation of alpha subunit of GS protein. This causes PTH resistance. It is associated with Albright hereditary osteodystrophy where we can see short stature round facies and short fourth metacapal. Next is a case presentation. A 5-year-old boy is bought by his mother with the following abnormality that is uh, there is a windswept deformity of the lower limb. Here uh, the serum level of vitamin D is found to be low. So in this clinical scenario showing windswept deformity of the lower limb which is a combination of valgus deformity of one leg with varus deformity of the other leg this finding is uh, this finding along with low serum vitamin d points to a diagnosis of vitamin d deficiency rickets it is associated with an increase in parathyroid hormone levels hypocalcemia is a feature of secondary hyperparathyroidism Hypocalcemia refers to total serum calcium less than or equal to 8.4 mg per deciliter. The causes include low PTH like in hypoparathyroidism, high PTH in chronic kidney disease, vitamin deficiency, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, hyperphosphatemia. Other causes like loop diuretics, calcitonin, bisphosphonates, massive blood transfusions, hyperventilation, hypomagnesemia, that is uh, magnesium is essential for PTH release and in case of severe hypermagnesemia higher magnesium levels suppresses PTH secretion. Hypocalcemia causes tetany or increased neuromuscular excitability. It can cause paresthesias, cramps, spasms and seizures. Latent tetany can only be detected by performing chostic and trochaeus signs. A prolonged QT interval is seen on ECG. Trochaeus sign or carpopidal spasm, classically it is seen in patients with hypocalcemia. Trochaeus sign is elicited by making the forearm ischemic by applying a spigmo manometer cuff to the arm and keeping the pressure above systolic BP for 5 minutes. The hand goes into a painful carpopidal spasm and assumes the acochose hand position. Hypocalcemia results in tetany or increased neuromuscular irritability. It leads to paresthesia and tingling of extremities and perioral area. Severe hypocalcemia can cause seizures. Chostex sign is also seen in hypocalcemia. Tapping the facial nerve in front of the tragus will cause spasm of the facial muscles. Tinnel sign is seen in carpal tunnel syndrome. It refers to a tingling sensation on tapping over the median nerve. 
Torsia sign refers to left supraclavicular lymphadenopathy in metastatic abdominal malignancy. Etidronate is not used in the management of hypocalcemia. It is a bisphosphonate used in the management of hypercalcemia. The goal in the management of hypoparathyroidism is to restore the calcium phosphate balance. The mainstay is calcium and vitamin D supplements. Other underlying conditions must also be treated. Instead of loop diuretics, thiazides can be administered on a low sodium diet as they enhance urinary calcium reabsorption.